Wow, church family, good morning. It has already been a blessing this morning, has it not, church? We've had a baptism. We've got to give of our, our gifts and our, our stewardship. We've got to sing about opening up the heavens. I, I looked around and you guys were singing this morning. I saw a few people clapping. I thought, Lord, you're moving. Amen? Amen. And so it's just a great day. You know, I, I tell you, when I was up there this morning and I got to church, I, I was thinking, you know, Father, sometimes we forget when these baptism waters are stirred, Lord, you're working. Father, you're moving. And so, folks, don't ever take this for granted. Amen? Don't ever take this for granted, but what we should be doing is anticipating more of this. What we should be doing is praying for more of this, to see God move. Because I want to tell you, the biggest things I've seen in ministry is when people see people moving for Christ, it stirs something in them, amen? And you just see something that happens that's beyond our power, that's beyond what we're able to do, because God is still in control, amen? And so, folks, I pray that you got your Bible with you this morning. I pray you got your sermon outlined with you this morning. I tell you, God has challenged me this week from what we have been studying on Wednesday nights to what we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks. And let me, uh, let me give you some encouragement. If you've been missing Bible study on Wednesday night, you're missing a blessing. Amen? Uh, God has really been opening up some scripture to our church. And I have just an awesome time with Bible study on Wednesday night. But I want you to open up to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. The Gospel of Luke chapter 12. We're only going to look at a few verses this morning from this parable. So the title of the sermon is this. And you can ask yourself this as you get ready to jump into the Word this morning. Are we rich toward who? Are we rich toward God? And this is something I want every person in our congregation this morning, especially all of our adults, to really ponder over, to really think about, to really pray about. The late Christian author and pastor Warren Wiersbe, he once said these words. He said, covenantness is an unquenchable thirst for getting more and more of something we think we need to be truly satisfied. It may be a thirst for money or the things money can buy, or even a thirst for position and power. You know, it doesn't take long to notice it, what drives our world, our economy, our government, and our lifestyles. If you turn on the TV, you're going to see different shows that, that, that talk about the lifestyles of the rich and famous from the housewives of California to New York, to Atlanta, to matchmaking shows for millionaires. There's even TV shows that reveal the lavish lifestyles of some rich L.A. pastors. The truth is, many people have a fixation on the rich. But do these fixations point to the rich person? Or does it really point to their wealth? Many people believe that money buys happiness and that it answers all of life's problems and issues. And with lots of it, we can set back. We can save up, eat up, drink up, and be merry. Well, if this is the case, then most people have no issue of being rich toward themselves. And building up their own kingdom and their own treasures on this earth. But the question is this, what happens when our striving to become rich breeds greed? A love of wealth. And a lusting. <coughs> Excuse me, for more and more. What happens when the motivation of our lives becomes centered on making ourselves rich, but in return, we're not rich toward God. Church, does it really matter about our stewardship? Does it really matter about our offerings? Does it really matter about our tithes? Does it really matter what we give God? 
or what we don't give God. Now, this is a subject many pastors stray away from. This is a subject that many pastors, they don't want to talk about because we understand there's a realization that stewardship and money is not something that many people in the congregation want to hear. We understand that a lot of people in their mind, we have been told throughout the years, it's my money, I've earned it, I, it's, it I'm going to do whatever that I want to do with it, and nobody is going to tell me how I should give of my money. But the question is, does God care? Is there an expectation that's placed on Christians? That when we get saved, that when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, and when we pick up our cross and we follow Jesus, is there an expectation? Is there a responsibility that when you got saved and when you got dunked and you joined the local body of the church, was there an expectation at that moment that God placed on your heart? See, I believe there is. Does God expect us to be rich toward Him? Let's look at the Scripture. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21, as we talk about the parable of the rich fool. Verse 15, And then He said to them, Beware and be on guard against every form of what? Of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Sounds like an issue, doesn't it? And then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones, and I will store all my grains and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have many good, good goods laid up many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But then something changes, doesn't it? Something changes out of the blue here in verses 20 and 21. Look what happens. God says something. Now, this is what everybody wants to know today. Come on, church. Amen. We want to know what does God say. We want to know what is the truth. We want to know, well, what does God expect? What does God want of me? Well, look what God says. Verse 20 gets no clearer. But God said, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you've prepared? And look what God says in this next verse. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward who? Let's pray. Father, thank you for already working this morning. God, there is no place that I'd rather be right now, Lord. Father, you are moving. Father, I thank you for Scott, Lord, coming this morning and following through on baptism. Lord, work in his life in a great way and his family. And Father, I pray for those here this morning that don't know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Father, I pray that you would remove that stumbling block, Lord, and you would just make the gospel as clear as a crystal sea, Lord. Father, I pray for our brothers and sisters here this morning that has there's some conflicting issues over their stewardship. Father, they, they struggle. And Lord, it could be a spiritual issue could be a heart issue. Lord, it could be a numerous amount of issues. So, Father God, I pray this morning that you would speak through me in a way that is clear. Lord, in a way that, Father, don't, don't just tug at our hearts, Lord. But, Father, change us. Lord, we're so fixated on being rich toward ourselves that everything that we do in our life, Lord, we're building up our own kingdom. By, and then, Father, we're faltering, trying to help build yours. So, Father, I pray this morning, Lord, Help us not to just be rich toward ourselves. But Father, I, I pray this morning we're rich toward you. Open up our hearts, Lord. Open up our minds. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said. You know, every adult listening to this sermon this morning, whether if you're here or whether if you're listening at home, we realize that money makes the world go what? It's no secret. In the eyes of the world, the abundance of money may be life's biggest goal, but from God's view, 
It's a small thing. But as one person states, and I love what this individual said about money, it's what we do with this small thing that makes a big, eternal difference. The late evangelist Billy Graham, he said, Give me five minutes with a person's checkbook and I will tell you where their heart is. I don't know if that could be any more clearer today. Now, please don't misunderstand me this morning. Money is not evil by itself because money can be a blessing and an honor to God. But if we're not careful, money can become an idol. Money can become something that corrupts our lives. And then when it corrupts our lives, it will hinder our walk with who? With God. And it won't just hinder our walk with God, but it will hinder our relationship with each other. So what does Jesus teach us through this parable of the rich fool located here in the book of Luke? Well, I want you to get ready. This is where your sermon outline starts this morning, and it's very, very easy, and it's very, very general. I believe Jesus used this parable, number one, to remind us of this, that our lives are not defined by what we what? By what we possess. Your life is not defined by how much you possess. As Jesus began to teach that day, he, he didn't address just the man that wanted Jesus to tell his brother to divide the family inheritance with him, what happened a few verses earlier. But Jesus addressed the whole crowd that day. And notice what Jesus says, Beware and be on your guard of every form of what? Of greed. Every form of covetousness. Now, this word greed, again, it's sometimes translated to the word covenantness, but in the Greek it means this, to lust and have more than one's fair share. So I remember the words of Paul when he wrote to the Christians in Coloss. He said, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. And then I recall the words that Paul sent to Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 11, he said, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation, and a snare, and many, many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith. They pierce themselves with many griefs, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Paul's words to Timothy. So what is Jesus telling us then? In this verse, Jesus is saying, guard yourself against the lust for more and more money, more and more material possessions. Guard yourself against wanting your neighbor's car. Guard yourself from wanting your neighbor's boat. Guard yourself from wanting your neighbor's toys. Guard yourself from wanting your neighbor's spouse. Guard yourself from wanting your neighbor's life because greed can come in multiple what? Multiple forms. Then Jesus makes a statement. He says, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. You know, growing up as a teenager, and I know there's a few teenagers that are in here this morning, you get to that point in high school where you really start to notice who has stuff and who doesn't. And I can remember several of my friends having nicer cars, nicer CD players, nicer speakers, more money, and just more stuff. And I can remember wanting those things so bad because to me, at that point in my life, it defined who those people were. It, it gave me the idea that their life meant more than, more than mine. And it gave me the idea that they were better than I was. 
But as I matured, as I started to understand that our value in this life, it's not based off our wealth. It's not based off our parents' wealth. I started to notice that money and things may bring some momentary happiness, but it wasn't an everlasting happiness. As I started reading my Bible more and listening to the Scripture, I finally realized that roads to nowhere are hard to build. You'll figure that out later. Roads to nowhere are hard to build. I realize that, yes, God wants us to work. Amen. God wants us to get sweaty. God wants us to get dirty. God wants us to provide for our families. But God also wants to give, he wants us to give our lives to Him if we want happiness that lasts and endures. I love the story that Ken Hughes tells us in the commentary. There was a father that passed away that had six daughters. And one of the daughters and her husband rushed home for the funeral, and as they comforted the poor mom, they, they noticed in mute amazement that everything in the house had been tagged by the other sisters with their names. This is Judy's. This is Margaret's. This is Annie's. She and her husband were appalled, but they said nothing. The table was set. And dinner was served at mismounting tension and awkward conversation. There were prolonged periods of silence. And then her husband stood in their mother's chair and said, Everyone's tagged what they want. We're placing our tag on what we want. And he placed his hands on the poor mother's shoulders. Greed is always ugly, and covetousness can turn a person and a family into a circle of hatred. Once again, a man's life does not consist, a woman's life does not consist of the abundance of one's possessions. And then number two, our security and happiness should not be placed on the what? The temporary. But, Father, isn't this what we do? Amen? This is what we have a challenging time doing. Now, I'm sure this man had come by his wealth in an honest way. I'm sure he worked hard. And God had graciously blessed him. He was a success, right? But unknowingly, he, like many people today, he was in great danger. Well, Brother Donnie, how in the world that somebody that's rich, how in the world somebody with great possessions... How in the world, somebody that's got everything, how can they be in great danger? Well, don't get me wrong. This man was, was smart. There was nothing wrong with building larger barns to house the extra that he was receiving. But I want you to notice something, church. And you've got to get to thinking a little bit this morning. I want you to count how many eyes there are in verses, six, or verses 18 and 19. I count four. I count. I, I, and I. In verses 18 through 19, I count four of them. Where in the passage is God ever even what? Mentioned. Not one time. I did it. I did it. I did it. I did it. See, this man was living if, as if there was no God. The Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It seems this man had no fear of God. And we know what Jesus says about this if you look back at verses 4 and 5. And so here's what it reminds me of. It reminds me one day there was a gentleman that walked into the barber shop. And his barber asked him the everyday questions about the weather. He asked him about family. He asked him about sports, etc. The man said, I'm doing so good. And so is my family and my life. And it's all because of the good Lord. And the barber paused and he said, 
Now, wait a minute. He said, you're giving credit to God? The man looked at the barber and said, well, absolutely, yes, sir. And the barber said, look outside. He said, do you see all those homeless people? He said, watch the news. Listen to the radio of all the bad things that's happening. And you're telling me that there's a God that exists? How can a God exist when all these bad things are going on? And the man paused for a minute, and he said nothing. His haircut was over. He told the barber goodbye. He walked outside, and he went by a man with long, straggly hair. And he turned around, and he ran back in to the barber. And he said, you know what? I don't think barbers exist. Well, how can that be, the barber said. I just gave you a haircut. Well, if barbers exist, you wouldn't see men and women going around that hadn't had a haircut in ages. And the barber said, well, yeah, but they have to come to me. And the man said, it's the same way with God. It's the same way with him. Great things had happened to this man in his life. But evidently he had no idea where he was going like many people today. And I say this because if you look back at verse 19, he says this, And I will say to my soul, So you have many good things laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This man was planning for what? Retirement. He had a big old nest egg in the bank. He was looking forward to the retirement years where he could take it easy so he could eat, he could drink, and he could be merry. Now, many of us, or some of us in here today, you're going to retire one day. And maybe there's several here this morning that's already retired. Maybe some of you in here this morning are right on the verge of retirement. But I want you to understand this as it leads into number three this morning is this. Christ does not bless us to be what? Selfish. Christ does not bless us to be what? To be selfish. Now I'm sure that all of us have worked hard. I'm sure that there's many of you in here this morning, you're still working hard. Matter of fact, more uh, hours now, we're working more years now than we've ever had to do in the past. And it's my money, and I should be able to do whatever I want to do with it. I deserve, Brother Donnie, to sit back. I deserve, Pastor, to take it easy. Pastor, I deserve to sit back, to eat up, to drink up, and to be merry. But do you really? Do you really? Psalm 92 verse 14 says, The godly will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. Now what does this mean, Pastor? It means that even as we age, there is work to be done for God. That's what that means. There is still a responsibility to God to help grow His kingdom. There is still a responsibility to God to be committed to His church. And there's still a responsibility to evangelize and disciple new members of God's church. So until we die, God has a plan for you on this earth in some form or some fashion. Now I will say this real quick and get my kicks in. For some of us, we need to get busy. For some of us, we need to join in. For some of us, we need to get to work. And watch what happens here in verse 20. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? The rich fool had made a difference, or he made a reference to his soul in verse 19, and now Jesus makes a reference right back saying, tonight your soul is required of you, and now who's going to own everything that you prepared? 
Now the question is, you don't see God, you don't see Jesus calling people names very often in the Scripture. So why would Jesus look at this man and why would he call him a fool? Well, he did this because life is short. He did this because what he was living for was materialistic. He did this because all that he had was based on what he had accomplished. So what does this tell us in a roundabout way? You cannot take it with you when you what? When you go. And let me tell you, in 14 years of doing funerals, I've seen a lot of things that people have tried to take with them. From gold to silver to money. I have seen it all. Which tells me they're not reading their what? Their Bible. Everything that we covet and greed for, it says you can't take it to heaven. Not our homes, not our cars, not our toys, not our bank accounts, not our retirements. But we can fix our eyes on what is not seen and have eternal effects in the lives of the people that are around us. Those are heavenly treasures, amen? That's storing up heavenly treasures. And in verse 21, Jesus closes with a challenge and a warning. And he says, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not what? And is not rich toward who? And is not rich toward God. Now remember this, God did not take this man's life because he was rich. That ain't why God took his life. Don't, don't read this out of context, church. You with me? Don't, don't, don't take this out of context. God did not take that man's soul that night because he was rich. God took that man's life because he was not rich toward God. Now listen, I'm not going to be held responsible with what God has blessed you with. But I am going to be held responsible for sharing God's word. And I am going to be responsible for what God has given me. Money, talent, spiritual gifts, my time knowing God and going for God. And I want you guys to notice this morning, I haven't even mentioned the word tithe, not one time this morning. Have I mentioned that word? Now, some believe the tithe is a thing of the past as Jesus fulfilled the law, and some still stick to it. But what I will say is this. The Bible tells us that Jesus calls us to be gracious and cheerful in our giving. Amen? I think I had this very conversation in my office this week. And I want you to listen to this. ChristianPost.com released the following on Friday, October 29, 2021, just a few months ago. Only 13% of evangelicals give 10%. 50% give away less than 1% of their income annually. Church, I'm going to ask you something real quick. Don't, don't shout it out. I want you to answer this question. Is 1% of our income back to God being rich toward Him? Is 1% of our income back to God being rich toward God? And then I read this article this week called Seven Signs of Greed. Church, hear this, because I'm only going to give you six. Greed, overly centered behavior. Greedy people, they lack empathy. Being concerned about the feelings of others is not part of their repertoire. They're never satisfied. They truly believe they deserve more, even if it comes at someone else's expense. Greedy people are experts in manipulation. They're highly talented in taking credit for work done by others. Greedy people are into the art of the short run. They're focused on saturating their immediate needs, and they leave it to others to cope with the consequences. In the pursuit of their material needs, they know no limits. Greedy people... 
are not good at maintaining boundaries. They'll compromise moral values and ethics to achieve their goals. God's working on some hearts this morning. I can feel it, and I know you can feel it. Malcolm Forbes once said, He who dies with the most toys wins. But can I make a rebuttal to that? The fact is this. He who dies with the most toys still dies. If someone asked you this morning, what does your life consist of? What would you say? What would you say defines your life and who you are? Who are you investing in today? Are we being rich toward God? Or is richly giving to God an obstacle that you have a challenge with? Let me say something real quick this morning as we get ready to close. You will never be rich toward God until you understand two simple things. Church, are you listening? Number one is this. God blesses us with the strength and the ability to work. God blesses you with the strength and the ability to work. So when you get up on Monday morning and you climb out of that bed and you go and you sit at that kitchen table and you have a bowl of whatever it is, fruity pebbles, tricks, I don't know what you eat. Maybe, maybe you got up and made pancakes, eggs, bacon. I don't know what your ritual is. But when you get up out of that bed and you go and you eat that breakfast and you go off to your work, thank God that he gave you the strength to get out of that bed today. That's God. When you get that paycheck weekly, every other week, bi-weekly, every month, and you get that paycheck, can I tell you who gave you that paycheck? Well, my employer did, Donnie. Well, see, no, 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 no. Number two, you've got to realize it all belongs to God anyway. It's all His. If you believe God created everything and everyone, then the gold and the silver all belong to who? He's just letting you be a steward of his money and his creation. And I firmly believe we're going to be held responsible. If someone found your checkbook laying around today, now some of us today, we don't use the checkbook much or a register like I used to do. But if someone got a hold of your expenses today, what would it say about you? Now, some may say, Brother Donnie, it's my money. I'll do whatever I want to do with it. It's nobody else's business. But isn't that exactly what the rich fool said? And where did that get him? Where did that get him? See, I believe our stewardship toward God is a reflection of our heart toward God. I truly do. Are you saved? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? Is He your Savior? Because if He is, when you come up that day and you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you said, Jesus, I'll follow you. Where you go, I what? I'll go. And that day that you gave your life to Christ, he didn't just save your soul. He also saved your pocketbooks. Amen? And everything in your life changed. And you said, Father, I will walk with you. I will give to you. I will love you. And I will love others. Church, I can promise you these are not the most enjoyable sermons to preach. But I also will tell you this. My wife and I have given a tithe of our offering to God and more ever since we have been married. We didn't at first. We didn't at first. There were times I didn't know how we were going to pay the bills. 
There was times even when I did not have a job at one point in our life. Working two jobs. And we still gave. Every week. You can't out give him. But if you're not giving, if you're not being rich toward God, why are you not? He gave everything for you. And we have a difficult time giving anything to him. It's his anyway. This morning, if you're not saved, I understand you're not giving to God. I truly do. But this morning, if you're a Christian and you've been, you've been so conflicted about what you should do, God lays it out, amen? Come up here and pray about it. Come up here and make a commitment to God, starting today, that you're going to give richly toward Him. And this ain't about me. This is about the responsibility that you have between you and God, not you and your pastor. Not between you and Billy or Austin or anyone else. This is a commitment that you have with God. Church, you've been challenged today. Come up and pray. Come up and pray for others. As Billy comes this morning, will you stand as we sing?